I'm at the Resource Management in Asia Pacific program in the, this university. And um, I was lucky enough to be in Mongolia for about three weeks and uh, do some desktop literature review on Mongolian uh, resource uh, situation, in particular the informal mining of gold by uh, the ex-nomadic herders. So that is my claim to fame uh, with regard to Mongolia. Uh, I have great pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Jargal Saikhan Dambardagya. And um, India is famous for uh, journalists who are very well educated and uh, who write books and, and do commentaries and all that. So I'm really pleased that, um, that um, if you may allow, if you allow me to call you as Jargal Saikhan, he has degrees from Moscow State University and also uh, USA. And here we have an economist who is also a journalist, so he wears many hats. And uh, uh, for example, he has been associated with uh, uh, Fair Tax and Wise Spending Group in Mongolia, also uh, the Taxpayers Association, and he has uh, worked for various resource companies. So I have great pleasure in inviting you, Jadal Saikhan, to come and give your presentation. What a wonderful place, a country, a city, in the lake in particular. Uh, I think this is not by chance you have Mongolian Institute at this university in this part of the world, in here, because we have uh, Igor Reshevitz, a doctor, I mean, we are honored, I think, have today him with us. And uh, it's a very critical time of our development. And we are here with a group that could back impact a lot on the way, what, we, what kind of decisions we make down the road. Today I am here to brief you with uh, economics, economic development of the country, some challenges and the way we are trying to solve these issues. And uh, I have made some uh, my notes on computer, and I think it, it can be available if uh, we need it. So, um, first of all, let me give you some snapshots of our economic development today. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, uh, as I was introduced, I'm trying to be the mirror of the society. The mirror is something, you know, it, is, it never cheats. So when you have a very bad, ugly face, somebody is trying to break down this mirror. And I want to make sure that this mirror is not broken, and the mirror is vice versa, helps the people to look better. That's, I think, a uh, social mission, or the way of my mission. I find myself, in, so in a way, certainly my passion as well. I do weekly economics column on politics, mostly sometimes, and then also interview called de facto, and try to interview interesting, prominent visitors and newsmakers in the country, so that our next generation, as Baba just now suggested, he's always more keen on the next generation, and he's always reflecting the current generation. And I think uh, it's, uh, it's our life. It's in everything in our hand to change today. So, uh, economy. <clears throat> I was comparing, before arriving here, uh, two countries, Mongolia and Australia. Interesting fact, your land is 10 times more, population is also 10 times more, GDP 10 times more, GDP per capita also 10 times more than Mongolia. But however, per person, does it work? Okay, does it work? Maybe you will increase the volume. <coughs> One, two, better. Okay. <clears throat> so I found out all this ten times. And then I found out also per capita we have, uh, Mongolia has a half thousand square meter per person. You have a 350. So a lot of problems could be same. The problem of big land, difficulty of creating proper infrastructure, 
etc. And a lot of similarities in the way we have been solving the economic problems. And we also uh, we have 90% of our export depending on mining. You have 55% as of today depending on mining. And we both uh, depend on one commodity, coal. And first time we have oversold Australia last year to China with coal and coal. So down the road a lot comes that we will address everybody here in this audience will hear and uh, touch these issues. Uh, our economic overview could be said with two words described, growing but volatile. Average growth rate between 1997-2011 was 6.3%. But nominal GDP per capita has increased sixfold between 1977 and 2011. Our HDI Human Development Index is 0653, which is which places us 110th in the world. Economy almost quadrupled by 2020, with average growth of 15%. Last year we were the largest, fastest growing economy in the world. The same history was only with Qatar. And Mongolia will be the fastest growing economy in the world in between 2010 and 2013. Overall it will be on the average about 10% according to Citigroup Global Market. But our economy is highly reliant on the mining sector, as I told you. <coughs> we see a lot of our future connect with copper price, gold price, and coking coal price, which are not going to be very high like a couple of years ago. But our policies remain the same. Today, the country economy is driven by two major projects. One is Ayutthaya, as you know, and it will reach 800,000 tons of copper concentrated by 2020, and 28 tons of gold. Estimates suggest that 25% of GDP in 2020 will be that project alone. The second project is Tawan Tawai Coal King Coal Mine. We have a lot of ups and downs around this project. Private sector owns a part of it. And then now the government is very heavily working on getting somebody coming like Peabody on that project. And it will be 40 tons, million tons uh, a year. Surprisingly, two of these largest projects important for Mongolia are headed by Australian executives. Both were 10 days ago in Hong Kong, where we had an investment summit, the largest investment forum outside of the country, held every year. Uh, <clears throat> we, we are concerned about two things. One is the quality and the infrastructure. Major hurdles to conducting business in Mongolia is inefficient government bureaucracy, taxes, supervision, regulations. Second, access to financing. Third, government policy instability. Fourth, law and contract enforcement. The fifth and the worst is corruption. And infrastructure is another major hurdle for businesses. One is, uh, the major one is a bottlenecks at the border and quality of roads and air transport infrastructure. I keep writing in about each of the topic once a week. And when you address these issues, I'm always wondering, the country has everything, like Australia. And the only problem with us is uh, we are our governments, the way we are governed. 
give me some, uh, I'll give you some macroeconomics snapshots. Main purpose of macroeconomics policy, as you know, to be stable and sustainable growth, which is not the case because we too much depend on the couple of commodities. And all our life, our joy, everything depends on these two crazy commodities and how much we do sell these products. And our fiscal and monetary policies have been always pro-cyclical. That exacerbates economic volatility and uncertainty because things don't depend on us. It depends on our southern neighbor, where we sell our, almost everything. And it brought that disease, how we call it, I think you are familiar with that at a certain time period of your development, and increasing vulnerability from volatile commodity prices, as I told you earlier. It was very much seen and reflected in the, the crisis of 2009 and we're almost in front of another one. Same problem, same way of addressing, but unfortunately not the same uh, conclusion. Um, very procyclical fiscal policy. Our budget is growing as much as the GDP. And GDP depends on the coal and copper price sold to China. Though we made a wonderful law, fiscal stability law. And it is to start only from January in two months, in a, in a month. Where they should give, they should describe it a lot, discipline, decentralization of budget. Both never happened in this country before. And they say the deficit of our budget to be under 2% of our GDP which I don't believe it's going to happen. We, we have made a development bank and they made a, a loan, they made a, they issued bond under the government guarantee and we got $580 million immediately and subscription was 10 times more they say. What did happen with this money? We were paying every night $90,000 and we were not using for four or five months. And then finally they are now using it on the way, in the way they were not planning. More than that, now our government is going to issue, they got a permission for $5 billion from the government and they are working day and night to issue 1.5 of them before the end of this year. And $1.5 billion is a quite big money. $5 billion is whole our total budget. And this government is going to have a, such a two big pie, one is budget, the same pie as a fund. So with the current quality of the governance and planning, capacity to implement, that's another worry that the people watch. So that's why we are very worried about the more going deeper into this Dutch disease. And also uh, this, uh, <clears throat> our resource to be a curse, not the luck. Because uh, we have a very low quality of institutions like uh, the previous speaker was talking about the quality of schools and universities. Even we have, I think, our situation of quality in public governance is even worse. So they, we have, these are the challenges we have to face. <clears throat> so, uh, briefly, you see not well established economy, only 20 years history of market economy. Before it was 100%, there was no private sector 20 years ago in that country. So we are critical, yes. During 20 years, we made a lot. But well, could we do better? Yes. Nowadays, 
when the international commodity price for those products went down, our government still is going with very high budget, very high, big budget. And uh, last week we have adopted or we have approved government, the parliament had approved our uh, budget finally. But that budget is not much reflecting the current reality. And there, somehow our politicians were very, very busy saying that only that we are under the 2% of GDP deficit. They were not talking about the possible uh, lack of revenue of the budget. That's why they want to increase tax first time, very seriously. You know, for s just description for those who, who knows not much about our uh, tax system, real estate tax supposed to be 2%. Uh, I think not many people pay that. Second, profit income tax 10% and 15% after 3 billion two weeks taxable income, which is about $2 million. So usually we pay 10%. And we, ha we are one of the 27 countries in the world of flat tax, which makes quite competitive and which was also a good base for foreign direct investment to the country. But however, our government now is more to control our prices. And nowadays they are promising to keep the level of uh, fuel, which is basis of our economy, which is import from Russia, at the same level. What happens? We have a shortage for a couple of days and it will go on. Any government who wants to regulate price never succeeded. Our government, even worse, they fail. And now, again, the, I want to touch the issue of bond, which is going to impact very substantially the economy in coming two months. The feasibility study for the major projects is called Sanshan Industrial Complex. It's on the way to China, China, China on the, uh, at, at our current only Trans Mongolian Railroad. And they want to make a huge six plants complex cement, coke and coal, iron, and other, and other two, three factories. But I have one confusion. Government is saying that we will make this complex, we need money, we will put into that project. But bad news is, feasibility study is not clear, not completed. We want them to use all the money only for infrastructure to the door of every plant there, but not the particular plant itself which is to be made by private sector at their own risk with the foreign direct investment for with the foreign investors. But I, I'm worried the government doesn't see that in that way. And they want to make a, that project themselves, made their own corporation now. And that's the, I think, the duty, duty or in a way of our work of the civic society to make sure that the government Government never made good management, in Mongolia even so. We have a state-owned enterprises which all run with loss. What happens? Nothing. The, the, the political parties come to the power, change the CEO with their own people. And the guy is living and I, I haven't seen anybody from Mongolia, from Mongolian state-owned enterprises becoming very poor. That's why everybody wants to be a public officer nowadays. And this entrepreneurship spirit is dying, which was very strong during uh, that time when uh, early 90s. Uh, <clears throat> however, we made, uh, I wrote about that uh, an article called uh, When the, when when our ship makes maiden voyage to the financial ocean. So we sort of, we're going to issue that big money and we're going to have a big financial income. But it should be profitable. <clears throat> so what is economic outlook now? We still have these two problems. Unless institutional and economic policy challenges are addressed, 
we will have still high economic growth, we will have a rising inequality, and dominant, non tradable and mining sectors, and a volatile economy with many uncertainties. Governance quality, just I will, let me address just two of them very briefly. Uh, review of various surveys point, very interesting picture. There is a, as you know, corruption index. We are ranking at 120th out of 183 countries. It's Transparency, Transparency International 2011 statistics. Second, index of economic freedom. We are ranked at 81 out of 179 by Heritage Foundation, 2012. Or there is a World Bank, a book called Doing Business by uh, 483 countries. We are ranked 86th country. Or the last one, World Competitiveness Index. We are ranked 93 out of 144 by World Economic Forum. So that's the reality, this, this snapshot, that's the mirror reflection of what we are today. Of course, some don't recognize, some get angry. Challenges, second part of my presentation. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. And I have just tried to group it into small categories. Well, first of all, <coughs> the most, I think, the corruption. You know, uh, I was running this morning at the lake, Burley Griffin Lake, as we call it. And there was a sign, it says, Government Act for the Queen, Law, and for the People. And there were description of this public park, the lake, and the law related. And I shared with my colleagues this morning, <laughs> hey, it's, they are written there like this. And one of my colleagues, Mr. Kambal, said, well, in Mongolia it should be for me and for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very uh, correct remark. That's the way how public governance works. And that's the most challenge. And this challenge is, should address one issue, transparency. Second issue after that, accountability. Whoever comes to that positions I was giving an interview before the election to Al Jazeera. I said, the former president in prison, what do you think? I said, well, it doesn't matter. Whoever, whatever positions you have, as soon as you are, you have done something wrong, you should be held accountable. Otherwise, it has no sense. That's what we do. And today, the, what is good about the new government is they are fighting with that corrupt people. But my worry is if they go too deep, they may find their own people as well. <laughs> so that is another dilemma we have to face and we have to address. Without solving this issue, we cannot make the economic progress we want for everybody. <clears throat> but we have a wonderful weapon for that called democracy in which Mongolians believe that democracy makes us okay, 120, 180 universities, whatever, many of them, by the way, our politicians make these schools, and many conflict of interests that uh, we use, we, we enjoy in the country. Of course, what do you expect? The people had no right. They have a right to speak to their heart for the last 120 years. And this democracy is a something that is not our neighbors possess. Pos oh, we mean possession. It's true. You know that. And now they, these days, in our southern neighbor, there is a selection is happening. They have a select few people prepare for 10 years. In our northern neighbor, they have select only two persons, you know. <laughs> so compared with that, uh, there is democracy. <clears throat> if we use properly, in the right way, in the better way that you have been trying, we will do wonder. I believe in Mongolians. 
I believe we can do it. We have educated people. Even some of them are here. Many educated Mongolians are coming back first time after 20 years. We have now new generation Babur, which doesn't know about communism, about Lenin, about everything what is related with the old time. So that is the base of our future change. And that's the audience I try to address. Yes, we are dependent on our neighbors. I say that and I was quoted in a, in a not very pleasant way there in the Russia. But however, they are our neighbors. We have that feeling towards China, but China is our largest customer. And you cannot kick all the time your customer, no? <laughs> so you have to respect your customers, in particular ordinary customers of China. We have some different mixed feeling about state-owned enterprises there. And I wrote an article about that. And uh, unfortunately, that triggered a uh, different effect that uh, I was uh, completely different than I was expecting. I was suggesting to stop state-owned other country, foreign countries, state-owned companies to come to Mongolia and to own our shares. Because we have privatized finally our own state-owned ones. And why the other state, foreign state-owned companies should do come? Stop it. But our politicians overdid, overarched it. They took back the draft law. And just before election, they made a very stupid law. They have forbidden to come. They call strategic uh, sector, other than mining, uh, telecommunication, banking, what else? The other media. media. They have included these three sectors as, uh, as strategically important sectors, and they every nobody can own there more than fifty-one percent. I mean, less than. But I mean, uh, forbidden to own th that much in with these three sectors. After which, we have stopped basically foreign direct investment to the country, which was almost as much as our uh, GDP every year. So that's the reason why the government immediately want to borrow money from a stock exchange. And I think that's why I am very afraid that this bond proceeds may go to cover current costs in the budget. Basically, we are coming from the belief, the civic society or informed Mongolians, come to believe that government should do only the things that private sector cannot do. And government, the first and for most uh, duty of the government is to protect only three things our rights, liberty, and our property. And they always do more than that, and which is uh, in the Russia, in the Russian, it's called uh, bear service. You know, bear is trying to do the most to give a, a birthday uh, present to a, uh, I think, to uh, a. Hague, and overall with that uh, barrel of uh, barrel of honey, fall down and destroy the whole ho house of the poor head. Uh, we have an, uh, a lot of important issues to solve. One of them is a property issue. Our lands are not uh, privatized. It's called, it belongs to everybody and the state is managing on our behalf. As a result, we don't have development in the countryside. We have a big migration of our herdsmen to the city. That's why Ulaanbaatar is the only city where 48% of the country is in one crazy city. Very badly managed, completely corrupt. And only from last election we expect we have changed the power and we expect some positive changes, which we started to see. But I, I want it to go way deeper. And that's why I was just this also talking about the, uh, you have a case called Mabo case, indigenous people land right. Unless we do the similar things, but this is a little bit different, two quality wise different things, but that issue, if not addressed in Mongolia, we will at the end end up having nobody in the countryside of Mongolia. Every Mongolian will be inside, and I think our herds will be uh, wild animals. In particular, with this new complex, where we expect about several thousand Mongolians coming and working, 
That's going to be another big challenge of our lever. We have already that with only one project, I will talk about. There are 14,000 people are working. Actually, 9,000, 14 all, the, including everybody, sub uh, contractors. But out of 9,000, a majority Chinese workers are not. Why? Because we cannot su supply immediately those uh, needed uh, labor there. The same issue of property in Ulaanbaatar city, where a half of population lives in our own gear, in fences surrounding the city center. If each land property is not registered and uh, put into the economic uh, cycle, this issue will not be solved. And there's somehow very uh, law with that movement. Uh, these are the challenges, very short, and I found also another very interesting parallel. Forty years ago, on this day, one of your leaders, Gough Whitlam, said today, 40 years ago, it's a time to choose between the past and the future, between the habits and fears of the past and the demand and opportunities of the future. It is like exactly the, it is to be said in Mongolia today. Uh, if you uh, paraphrase this one, I would say, it's a time to create new opportunities for Mongolians. Time for a new vision of what we can achieve in this generation, not in the next generation. For our nation and the region in which we live. Well, that's the description of the vision you had here 40 years ago. That's what we want to see in Mongolia. And there are a lot of things similar we will face what you did. Only thing is, it should be here, this time, cheaper, faster, and smart. Because we will go through the path that you made. And finally, uh, let me share with you some points on the diversification of our economy. There was a group from Harvard, uh, Michael Porter group in Mongolia two years ago. You know, they did about 60, 70 countries all around the world, and they put the theory of competitiveness. So what are those competitive sectors in Mongolia? The analysis says, you can Google and find that. It says, competitive in certain sectors Mongolia can be tourism. I think it's sustainable tourism in the current uh, terms of our understanding. I uh, interviewed the other day uh, National Geographic Sustainable Tourism Board Chair. We have talked extensively on that, uh, you can see on my website. Meat. Our meat is very well, in particular lamb. And people who come to Mongolia change their mind about lamb. Nothing to say about Chinese, uh, about the Japanese who saw our sumo races being a uh, beating all of them for the last 10 years. <laughs> and they now completely like them, and their consumption has increased substantially. Third, Kashmir. You know that Kashmir. And I turned out, uh, you know, I went to Italy uh, to a factory which prepares Kashmir uh, cloth for big names, Chanel. So this Kashmir is from Mongolia. So why you don't write there Mongolia? Why you said made in Italy? You don't have a gold here. <laughs> it turned out Kashmir fiber is getting thinner when the gold location is coming higher. And that's the place in Mongolia. We have a, a Aima called Bayim Hongor. Higher in colder. Higher in colder, yes. That fiber has become very well, and unfortunately, we were not marketing. And the whole world knows. The whole world knows about the quality of Kashmir, but they don't know that this is coming from Mongolia. The fourth is IT, surprisingly, in particular IT services. Somehow, it happened that the Mongolians are crazy of us speaking many languages. You will be, I mean, everybody here sitting in Mongolia is probably two or three foreign languages they speak. But somehow it happened, they are quick with that. And I think this whole IT service could be used there. The last one is mining logistics. Here we, you will have a more competitors there 
down the road 10 years from now or 20 years, Australia will. Mongolia is now already working in Kazakhstan and Africa, Mongolian mining logistics company, drilling companies. In Hong Kong, a guy was saying that he has a five times more job in Kazakhstan than in Mongolia now, a Mongolian company. Why? Oh, it's much easier to work there. They're, okay, Kazakhstan is Kazakhstan, but it's stable. He said, I'm doing more money there than in Mongolia. Um, so, to wrap up, I explained to you about the current situation of economy from my perspective and challenges we face that we should solve. And uh, I, I told you most importantly that I think we can overcome it because we have everything there. We have a youth, young generation. Well, major, half of Mongolians are under 35 years old. If they are properly powered with knowledge, empowered by IT, probably we are now the one of the most traveling nation as well. You know, on my website, there are always access, for, you can see all around the world. Brasilia, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, Mongolians are approaching and they, I mean, obviously they are reading in Mongolian, so it means they are some Mongolians, huh? So they are all around the world we are, in a way. When they will come back, when they want to come back, and they have a conditions that they can work, challenge, and get accordingly, then that's uh, Mongolia, what we want to see. That's what briefly I want to share with you. And uh, you can, what I told today, read in my website called www.jargaldefacto.com. I update that every week in Mongolian and in English. And all my interview is in, when it comes in English, it comes with Mongolian subtitle. So that you can see what's going on in the country from perspective of non-political observer. Thank you very much.